Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Soon afterward, he, that being Jesus, went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. What a beautiful story. The New Testament tells us that Jesus raised three people from the dead in his earthly ministry. We talked about Lazarus this morning, right? Just a little bit on the periphery of the lesson. Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son, which is in the lesson tonight. And as Jesus entered Nain, he encountered a funeral possession and a widow who was heartbroken. He approached the widow and told her not to weep. He was not saying weeping at a funeral is inappropriate, which some people will actually do. You know, don't show any tears, don't show any emotion. He himself wept at Lazarus' death. We talked about that this morning. But he was telling her that he was going to take away the reason for her weeping, the reason for her being sad. He then stopped the procession and commanded the young man to arise the man then sat up and began to speak. <laughs> but listen, they knew he was dead. Mm -hmm. they, knew he, they knew what death was. They knew that he was dead. So Jesus' power over death was manifested in a marvelous way. But that's only a part of the power demonstrated in this event. And that's what we want to look at as we look at five great powers. Five great powers. Number one, the power of death. And death is a universal power. Everyone's going to die unless we are blessed enough, fortunate enough, I don't want to use the word lucky, okay, but fortunate enough to live, be alive when the Lord comes again. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And we learn a lot of things about death in the scriptures. And a lot of we just know and understand, number one, death is no respecter of persons. Rich people die. Poor people die. The mighty die. And the low die. Young people die. Old people die. So it's, it's a universal. And it doesn't matter. We're not given a certain amount of time upon this earth, though, you know, four score and seven years. No, that was the, the other deal. Three score and ten years. Whatever. Okay? But we know that death is coming because we're not going to be able to stay here forever. That's not what God has planned for since the fall of man. God doesn't want us to remain in a fallen world in a possible fallen condition. He wants us to be able at some point to leave this fallen world in a saved condition to be taken to a place where we can live in paradise eternally. So death is no respecter of persons, and death is a power against which we as individuals are helpless. There's nothing we can do about it. Now, we can hasten it by doing foolish stuff. And we, we see it all the time, right? Driving down the highway 100 miles an hour all the time, or driving on the sidewalk, or <laughs> you know, just, just foolish things that we do that may hasten it. But we can also delay it, right? We can eat right. We can take care of our bodies. We can, we can do certain things. Now, it may not delay it, but it can help. 
but eventually death wins. It just, it just does. And we understand that. But death is a mysterious power. And mysterious in the sense that it often strikes when and where we least expect it. And we're hardly ever prepared for it. Few people get prepared for it. And the ones who do, what a wonderful thing that is. And, and you say, well, how can you say it's a wonderful thing? You think about the people who are on death row and they're about to be put to death. They've got an opportunity. They know what day, what hour their death is going to come, and they've got that opportunity to get right with God. Most of them don't. They choose not to. So we know it's coming. We know it's there. We know we're not, we know we're not going to escape it. So the greatest thing for us to do is be prepared for it on a day-to-day -day basis. Power, the power of death, that's one of the great powers of this life. Another great power in life is the power of love. And we see that in the case of this woman, this widow who's just lost her son. He was young, and he was her only son. She was old. She probably expected to go before her son. She, she needed somebody to take care of her. And she wept because of her love for her son. She probably wasn't even thinking about it. who's going to take care of me now. Back in those days, widows and children, little children, they, they were the weakest in society. People could take advantage of them in so many different ways. But, but here, it's, it's, it's this woman, she's pretty much lost her world, her only son. Her husband's been gone for a while. She's a widow. Now her son is gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Paul writes, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels that have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. This widow had no power to do anything for her son, but weep at his loss. That was it. She could mourn. <coughs> but she couldn't change the fact that her son was dead. So love, love has the power to make things happen, doesn't it? Yeah. Hate can cause bad things to happen, but love can make good things happen. Love can transform the worst sinner into a saint. And that's what the love of God can do for us. Love can cause people to fight and die for a country and freedom and family. Notice what was it in there? Self. So, because that type of love is selfless. Love can cause us to do things that are distasteful. Well, how would love get us to do things that are distasteful? To help somebody else? Yeah. To, to do something for somebody else so they don't have to do it? Yeah. That, that's the distasteful part of it. You think about Jesus going to the cross. You know, the night before, Father, if there's any other way, <laughs> this isn't tasteful. No other way. It had to be done. And he did it because of love. It was love that brought God's Son to die for us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if we believe in God, and we believe that Jesus Christ is his only begotten Son, then we ought to do everything in our power to serve the Father and the Son so that we won't perish. So that we won't perish because of the great love that they have for us. Love, is it distasteful to serve God? Well, no, not really when we look at it, but you know, in a worldly sense, uh, what, I've got to do things for people I don't like? I've got to love my enemy? That's pretty distasteful, isn't it? I don't have to like them, right? But I've got to do them good, because that's what agape means. So if my enemy's hungry, I've got to feed them. If they're thirsty, 
I got to give them water. If they need clothing, I give them clothing. Because that's love. It may be distasteful to do such for an enemy, but that's what we're called to do because of the love of God. I'm sure that there are people that, that God says, boy, that's, that's tough to, to, to love that person, and it's tough. If that person repented, I don't know. I don't know if God thinks like that. I don't know if God looks at people like that and says, I don't know if I want that person to be my child. I can't imagine God doing that, but I can imagine God saying, I don't think that person's ever going to repent. And then when that person does, it's like, oh, oh, you know, wow, they did. I'm going to take them. I'm going to take them back. That's the type of love. That's the power of love. Uh, who was it? Huey Lewis in the yeah, News. The you know, the song, The Power of Love. And that's what we see when we look at the cross. And that's what we see here. This woman's love for her son, this widow's love for her son that can only be expressed in the mourning that she was doing. This passage also shows us the power of tears. Oh, oh tears. Tears are the relief valve of the soul as the heart breaks with sorrow. the heart breaks, the tears flow. Samuel, the prophet of the Old Testament, spent an entire night in tears over King Saul's disobedience. Remember King Saul? He was the first king of Israel, right? The first king. And, and he started out as a good man. He, 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 he had everything handed to him, and, and he could have been a great king, a great man, but he had some problems, and he disobeyed God. I don't think Saul ever wept over his disobedience, but you know who did? Samuel. And Samuel wept all night because King Saul disobeyed God because he knew what it meant. The whole nation was going to suffer. And sometimes we get upset because we see things happening and we know the whole nation, our whole nation, is going to suffer. We think about Jesus. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, the city that should have been waiting for him, waiting for him and, and welcoming him. And they rejected him. And he knew that because of that rejection in 40 years, it was going to be wiped out. And that temple that was his, his house, built for him, was going to be destroyed because it had become corrupt. And he wept over it. That's the power of tears. Psalm 126, verse 6, He who goes about weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. What, 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 are, you, what are you talking about? Well, if we don't mourn about stuff, how are we ever going to change anything? If, if we're not concerned and weeping over the loss, Will we ever really have the power within us to help save the lost? Think about it. If we don't really love the lost enough to cry over the lost. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and then verse 4. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. Verse 4, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. And that time to dance, you might say, a time to rejoice. Because that's what the Apostle Paul says, right? Mourn with those who mourn, weep with those who weep, and rejoice with those who rejoice. power of tears is great because 
Tears are like seeds that's being planted for joy to come later. We have here a demonstration of the power of prayer. It's a fourth great power that we're looking at this morning or this evening. The power of prayer is its ability to change people in circumstances. But you know who prayer changes the most? The person doing the praying. Yeah. Because really, we ask God to change people, but that, that what we should be asking for is, you know, God, help us to be able to help people to change. And surely this widow had prayed intensely for her son for her son to get well, for the circumstances to be different, and, and maybe even that once he died, that, oh, you know, the, the Jews believe that within three days that spirit could come back to the body, that it lingered there for three days. That's why four days with Lazarus, it was like, okay, all hope is gone. He, he stinks by now, you know. Uh, but the answer's delayed, right? When we pray, sometimes the answer's delayed. So God answers prayer in three ways. Yes, no, and we'll just wait a little bit. You know, the answer's coming. Uh, I talked before about in the book of Daniel, when Michael is being sent to Daniel, and he finally gets there, and he says, I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner. I was delayed. I was fighting with somebody over here, and I, you know, they were standing in the way. They were causing me to be delayed. And sometimes we just have to wait for God's answer. But God did answer her prayer. And He answered in the best way. He answered in the best way by sending His Son to her. As He answers our prayers by sending, having sent His Son to us. And He's going to send Him back again. What a wonderful thing. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. But we got a call. What, 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 what is that? Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Yeah. Power of prayer. Express. And then, then, then we have the example shown right here. Maybe that woman was praying, oh, before they put him in the tomb, can something happen? Can this be changed? And there was Jesus. And, and we know with what Jesus told Martha, okay, I'm the resurrection and the life. I know, I know at the end time, it's, he's going to rise again. We all know we have that hope. Number five. Finally, we see the power of Christ. The power of Christ. And the power of Christ, it, it's an infinite power. But a particular power that we would want to see here is Jesus' compassion. Christ's power and compassion, because that led to the resurrection of the widow's son. Next to creating everything that we see and know here in this physical universe, creating it out of nothing, negating death must be one of the great powers of Christ. What did we start off with? What was the number one great power? Death. And look at here. Negating the power of death. Is a greater power. And that's a power that Christ has. The power of his in the, in the power of his presence, demons fled from before him. Till the time of the end, when they go to the lake of fire and brimstone. <coughs> the power of his voice and his words was amazing. No man ever spoke like this, John chapter 7, verse 46. That was the guards who went to arrest Jesus. After the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds were amazed. No, one, no one's ever spoke like this. He, he, 
he speaks as one having authority. He wasn't guessing about anything. He knew what to say. And if we look back at it, I believe you can understand it, that he's the one who gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. It was the Lord. Another great power is the power of his touch. He touched broken bodies and healed them. We talked about the blind man. We talked about Jairus' daughter. All, that, all those that we talked about, the healings that he did of the touch of Jesus, the power of Christ. But what about the power of his blood to atone for our sins? What a great power that is when, when we think about the Lord's Supper and how that in baptism we come in contact with the blood of Christ because in his death he shed his blood and our baptism is our dying with him, being crucified with him, and being buried with him, and then rising in newness of life, a figure of his death, burial, and resurrection. The power of his blood atones for our sins. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The power of Christ is greater than all the powers that we see in this world because he is the creator of this universe. By his word he spoke all things into existence. And by his word, when he comes that second time, as we learn in our studies on Sunday morning, he'll bring it all to an end. He'll say it's finished, it's done. Jesus possesses and exercises the power to turn our mourning into rejoicing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, from the Sermon on the Mount, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's all right to mourn. It's all right. Thank God for the amazing power given to the Lord Jesus Christ and to us to defeat every enemy we will face. We cannot do it on our own. But in Christ, they're already defeated. It's just a matter of facing them, and they back down because of who we are in, who we are in fellowship with, the Son of God. That's our lesson for this evening. I hope we can get some good out of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation.